With that, just a little background, if you're not real familiar uh, um, with, uh, with Round Govey, um, a little life history here, and some of this stuff is, is important to pay attention to because it kind of comes into play uh, later uh, with that. Um, native to Central Eurasia, um, that's the same place your descendants came from. Uh, in, mainly inhabit near shore rocky habitats. They, uh, they reproduce several times a, a year and, uh, and are very aggressive, uh, especially uh, defending their spawning areas. Uh, they're voracious eaters of Dracaenids. That, that, that's important. Uh, fish, eggs, and fry as well too, and invertebrates. Uh, mainly in Lake Erie, we see them uh, less than six inches, but supposedly there is some horses in Lake Ontario that make it up to 10 inches, and sometimes I've heard it even larger than that. So uh, this talk isn't just about gobies, it's really a goby dracaenid talk. Uh, and in order to do that, we kind of really need to go back a little bit and, and give you an idea of Lake Erie in the pre dracaenid period, which is, uh, we'll say, before 1990. Uh, during the dracaenid period here, uh, zebra quagga mussels, so basically the decade of the 90s. And, and, then, uh, and, then, and then after the Gobi invasion in about 2000 in, in, in the East Basin. Um, and so throughout the talk, uh, I'll, it's not quite showing up on that. Uh, if you see this, the Dracaena there, that's the Dracaena period. And then the Dracaena and the Gobi is the Dracaena Gobi period. So 2000 and afterwards. And those would be themes that you'll see uh, throughout the talk today. So two quick slides here on the, on the pre dracaenid period, one on that, one on Dracaenids, and then uh, the whole rest of the talk is going to be about the, 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 the after the Gobi invasion. Um, so talking about nearshore productivity, uh, again, before, before zebra mussels came, uh, came high, again, our target area, I don't know if that's showing up here at all, red there, our, our target area is here in gold uh, um, for uh, let's see, for our, our lower trophic level measures there, that's a, a mesotrophic, uh, which is what we're shooting for for Perkins, Perkins and Lake Erie. Uh, you'll see that in a couple more slides there. You see our mean sucky with that was actually right in that zone uh, for productivity. Uh, maybe a little bit lower, notice that the uh, scale here actually goes from uh, um, shore to deeper here, so actually getting shallow. So more productive is high, less productive is down at the bottom. And in response to that, if you look at walleye and perch, uh, again, very short time frames here, uh, there, but uh, pretty good fisheries compared to what you're gonna see uh, coming up with here in, uh, in this next period here, which is your Dracaenid period. So again, a massive shift uh, once Dracaenids came in uh, uh, to Lake Erie, uh, basically shifting all the production from the pelagic zone down to the, the benthic zone into, uh, into the mussels. Uh, we saw huge uh, increases uh, in lake, uh, uh, lake clarity here, uh, two to three times, uh, some of them over 25 feet, uh, big difference from 10 feet or sometimes even less uh, over in our east basin uh, of the lake. Uh, and as a response, uh, uh, with all the productivity falling out, we saw huge declines in our walleye and perch populations in the lake, uh, heading uh, right through the decade, right up to 2000. So, Moving into our gobies here. So uh, first discovered in, in Lake St. Clair uh, in 1990, uh, most likely via a uh, ballast water introduction there, quickly spread throughout the lake. Uh, we have them arriving in the East Basin by the late 1990s, and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more. Uh, and they really brought a fear of, of negative impacts on the ecosystem and the fishery, mainly because they were such a prolific egg eater. There were big fears of smallmouth bass uh, really going down the tubes uh, um, uh, with that uh, of not being around. So um, here's our gobies down. Oops, sorry about that. Here's our gobies down here in red. Uh, this is from our, our East Basin Trawl Survey. Um, really beginning uh, very few numbers in 1999. Started ramping up in 2000. Really reached a peak around the middle 2000s. And then we saw a decline and, uh, and basically at a stable level uh, here for the last seven years uh, in the lake. So the other species I have up on there is, is smelt. And smelt is our other main forage uh, fish for a lot of the predators, walleye, lake trout. We'll talk about that uh, here in a minute. Um, uh, in the lake, um, and, and 
So in the period before gobies came in, it was mainly pelagic smelt. Well, when, when gobies came in, it offered a new predator uh, uh, with that in, in the form of a predator that was also a benthic predator, which really what we didn't have before. So uh, not only did you have smelt, but now all of a sudden you had a benthic, uh, a benthic prey item uh, on the bottom as well. Looking at our water transparency, so um, so notice that we start seeing here in the uh, in the in the middle uh, of the 1990s uh, increases uh, in that a little bit earlier than our than our 2000s, and it takes a little while there, but you can definitely see an upturn in our water clarity, meaning that the system is being less productive in this. Our secchi depths are getting less, and our productivity is right in the range right in the range of where we want it to be for walleye and yellow perch production. And lo and behold, look what happens to walleye and yellow perch in that same period, an almost immediate response on the blue line here, which is yellow perch <coughs> coming out of 2000s once gobies came into the system there. Uh, perch populations have really expanded and exploded in the East Basin. And uh, walleye took a little bit longer, but they have followed suit. Uh, as well too, and uh, and actually at uh, at very high abundances right now. Let's look at diets. You got a few graphs of diets here. So this is our benthic predator diets. This data is from uh, OMNRF over in Long Point Bay, directly across the lake from our uh, office in Dunkirk. Uh, there, and then looking at uh, at yellow perch and smallmouth bass. So uh, this is percent occurrence uh, of gobies. Uh, in their diets, and you can see as they uh, uh, increases in fun, both of these species of, uh, of gobies of importance in their diet to the point now, they're about over 80% in, in bass and in yellow perch uh, um, uh, currently here. So another thing that's of interest here is you see them showing up by 1997 in their perch diet. So. We started catching them in our trawls in 1999. Fish and Wildlife had them in the trawl sample in 1998. We have them in diets in 1997. So chances are is that gobies were already out in the lake before we even saw them out in, in our trawls in those near shore rocky areas where we don't trawl and the predators were already taking advantage of them uh, at that time uh, before we even knew that they were around. Another benthic predator, this time a cold water one, burbot, uh, out in the deep water there, mainly eating smelt uh, prior to the goby evasion, but notice the, the huge declines when gobies started coming in and basically flip-flopped for the most part to the point now where gobies have become the main prey item for burbot out in the cold water. Let's switch gears and look at a pelagic predator here, lake trout, cold water predator here, again, uh, before gobies came in, smelt the main main diet item, but you notice that smelt still remained the main the main diet item for lake trout. But there are years where gobies are, are important, and it's usually those years where smelt are down in the population, they switch over to gobies, and, and, and gobies become a much more important prey item uh, available when the smelt aren't there. Um, but still has relieved relieved a little bit of the impact that they've had and, and not exclusively feeding on smelt anymore. Switch to growth here. We're going to use smallmouth bass. This is definitely our, our best example uh, of growth here. Age two and three smallmouth bass. Uh, you can see that it, it basically between the uh, pre-Dracenid and Dracenid period pretty much flat line. But again, you see this response starting in the late 1990s, again before we sampled them. Of, of both two and three year old bass starting to increase in growth. And, uh, and, and right now we have some of the highest growth or, uh, or actual uh, sizes uh, of those two age classes out in the population uh, um, and, 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 and due to the, the abundance of, a, of, a, of the near shore benthic uh, prey item. So here's one that's maybe a stretch a little bit uh, with this. This is data actually from our cold water survey, a cold water gill netting survey. So this is nets set uh, at the thermocline and beyond. So you're thinking in, the, in August, uh, 80, 90, 100 feet here. 
And this is actually the catch of smallmouth bass uh, out in that survey. Now, for sure, this was, this was just a portion of the smallmouth bass population. Most of the smallmouth bass were still in the near shore areas. But what it did show was that there was a portion of the population that did that, that was offshore at this particular time of the year and, uh, and occupied a cold, a, a basically a cold water existence out there, or at least a portion of the year um, then. However, um, once that other prey item became available in the late 1990s, that whole trend changed. We no longer catch smallmouth bass. In fact, we haven't seen one in years uh, out in this particular survey. Uh, those bass are no longer uh, occupying that zone at that time of the year and, uh, and most likely we believe it's because of the abundance of, the, of, of prey and benthic uh, easier prey item that's in the, uh, in, in the waters near shore. So uh, again, this one might be a, a, a slight stretch here, but uh, this is actually a rainbow smelt, yearling and older, okay, not young a year, yearling and older abundance age one and then, and, then, and then age two and older here. Uh, again, pre, okay, this is the pre, um, actually the Dracaenid period here, mostly age one smelt, we're in our population. Um, after gobies uh, um, were around, we started to see some bigger, some older smelt that started showing up in our populations that weren't there prior to that. Uh, so maybe a little, a little um, predation pressure there of gobies uh, actually taking away some of the pressure on the smelt population and the smelt population actually able to get some larger and older individuals uh, in the population that they weren't there earlier. So with any invasive species, of course, we have negative effects uh, with that. So uh, this is again our trawl catches. Um, there are uh, no different scales for each of these. I think Johnny Darter is here on the right. Uh, with those, we have the uh, Dracaenid and, and uh, Gobi Dracaenid period here. And uh, there's our Johnny Darters. Uh, pretty much took it on the chin here once Gobi's invaded, and we haven't seen one in years out in our trawling survey. Um, sculpin are probably another species there. We don't have good data from this survey. We believe sculpin, we haven't seen one of those. Uh, in a long time either in our, in our East Basin. And I uh, believe that those are another species that, that became vulnerable uh, when, when gobies invaded. And of course, maybe, maybe the biggest downfall of gobies has been uh, the type B botulism um, that, that, is, um, that was very, um, very much in, in the news, uh, still in the news, not so much Lake Erie. I believe uh, Lake Ontario still sees uh, some events. Um, round gobies were the, were, were the real connection between uh, uh, Dracaenids and the upper food web um, uh, um, of uh, fish eating birds, uh, sheep's head, smallmouth bass, especially lake sturgeon, species that, uh, that, that, that feed on gobies, and then your diving ducks, loons, and, uh, and seagulls, and, uh, and, and other um, ducks such as old squaws. Uh, really took it on the chin. We had huge mortalities back in the early 2000s um, as, uh, as that botulism ran through the system. So, um, so let's look. So here's, here's some of our, our main positive points on the side of the friend here. Uh, they provided uh, a Dracaenid predator, which we, which we didn't have before. Uh, definitely, we see reduced effects of Dracaenids in the system uh, once gobies have come in. Uh, definitely have increased the pelagic production in the food web away from the uh, uh, benthic zone and back up into the pelagic where it can be used by the fish. And, uh, and, and they have provided an, al an alternative benthic species that really uh, was not available all prior to them. On the bad side, uh, they displaced or eliminated um, some competing benthic species. Um, Lake and a type B botulism, which we just talked about, and just in general, they're another invasive species. We're always trying to get our lake, bake, our, our Great Lake systems, uh, back to uh, you know as many native uh, species and, and uh, native ecosystem as we can. Here's another species yet to add on to the mix that um, that uh, that will be here with us forever, uh, and uh, 
So just sort of a wrap-up statement, Round Gobi have created an environment closer to the pre jacinid Lake Erie, and one in which persids are, are, are once again thriving, but with any invasive species, they have brought unforeseen negative consequences. With that, uh, I'd like to thank the crew out at the Lake Erie unit. We do a lot of work out there, and uh, we get a lot done. Everybody is, is really awesome. It's a great place to work. And uh, I got some data from uh, our friend Tom over on the North Shore as well, too, so thanks to him. And I'd be happy to answer any questions.